Good afternoon, everybody. Today, for our uh, elementary soil mechanics lecture, we're going to be talking about a very special and dangerous, potentially dangerous case of effective stress known as zero effective stress. We're also going to be talking about a different subject, but that's related to effective stress, and that is effective stress in partially saturated soil or uh, also known as the zone of capillary rise. Zero effective stress is something that, that we as geotechnical engineers fear because geo, uh, zero effective stress means that if I have a, uh, let me erase my old drawings here, if I have different soil particles that are touching, And in between the soil particles, I, of course, have uh, water, so it's saturated. Zero effective stress implies that the pressure induced from my water, the buoyancy stress is pushing out from my water, on the soil particles are large enough that the particles themselves are going to almost act like they're suspended in the water and not touching one another. And if that's the case, then the soil really has no strength. It behaves more like a liquid and some scary things can happen. Um, it, you know, at a bare minimum, we might end up with things like giant voids or sand volcanoes like these. Um, or in the case of an earthquake, we might see something that looks like this. This is an old video recording. Um, it's in Japanese. I don't speak Japanese. But this is soil liquefaction during the 1964 Niigata earthquake. It was recorded on an old 35-millimeter uh, video camera. And that's groundwater that's running across the runway. The groundwater is being forced out of the ground by the uh, excess pore pressure generated from the earthquake shaking. And of course, if the, the water pressure is high enough to be ejected and blasted out of the ground, imagine what the poor soil particles are feeling. And so, you know, I would expect there be a lot of settlement and a lot of potential ground deformation wherever this type of liquefaction is occurring. <clears throat> we discussed um, last week how seepage can definitely have a significant effect on the effective stress of the soil. You'll recall that effective stress equals total stress minus the pore pressure. And so pore pressure is what relates to seepage. And so um, <clears throat> if the seepage is, uh, you know, depending on what the seepage is doing, it's going to impact the pore pressure, which in turn impacts the effective stress. Now you recall we said that if the seepage stress is moving upwards, in other words, against the force of gravity, it's going to reduce the effective stress. So what would happen if we had a seepage force moving up with such velocity in the soil that the reduction in the effective stress was really large. In other words, so large that the effective stress was equal to zero. And essentially making the soil particles um, separate and floating in the groundwater. So we can solve for um, a, an equation to, to predict when that condition would occur. So this is our equation for effective stress given a seepage stress right there where we have hydraulic gradient and depth into the soil and of course unit weight of water. So all I'm going to do is manipulate this equation and solve for the hydraulic gradient. We have a little C sub R below the I for the hydraulic gradient and that C sub R stands for critical. So if I then isolate that hydraulic gradient and solve for it, we see that the Z's cancel out. And we're left with this buoyant unit weight divided by the unit weight of water. Well, buoyant unit weight is simply the saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water. We can apply our phase relationship equations that uh, 
for the saturated unit weight. That's this guy right here. Now we can cross out the unit weights of water. They, they divide out, and we're just left with this equation right here. Now if we plug in a typical value for uh, specific gravity and a typical value for void ratio, the, that ratio is going to be around 1.0. It might vary between you know, um, 0 0.8 to 1.2 or so, but it's going to be somewhere in that range. Um, and that's going to be our critical gradient. That's going to be the gradient, which if that gradient exists in the soil, there will be zero effective stress and bad things can happen. Now we can compute a factor of safety against that zero effective stress condition. And that factor of safety might look something like this. I want to say something with regards to factor of safety. Now the DOS textbook that we use has an equation in there and some examples where it describes factor of safety equals the ratio of the total stress divided by the pore pressure. And I say no, I don't like computing factor of safety. That way I can show plenty of examples how computing factor of safety that way can lead us astray. Instead, I want factor of safety as a ratio of the critical hydraulic gradient divided by the maximum actual hydraulic gradient that's in the soil. And typically, as geotechnical engineers, we're going to design this factor of safety to be greater than two. I would never send anybody into a hole where that factor of safety against uh, zero effective stress was less than 1.5 for sure. I prefer two. So there's lots of different phenomena in geotechnical engineering that are related to zero effective stress. The first is what we call boiling. So boiling occurs when um, groundwater is rushing to the surface and it, it comes up with such uh, ferocity and velocity that it looks like the ground is boiling. And it can result in what we call sand boils. These are little sand volcanoes that appear on the ground uh, after the, the seepage is ended. Um, another term that, or another phenomenon that we see is called piping. Piping usually occurs beneath the ground due to high gradients. So if I draw a cross section of a dam, and back behind the dam, let's say I have my water. So what's going to happen with piping is I have a spot maybe inside of my dam that starts to erode. And, um, the material gets taken out with the water and carried uh, away through the other soil. And so the velocity begins to increase in that little void and as such it starts to work its way back, work its way back, work its way back until eventually it daylights. And then what I have is I have basically a tube of just pure water going directly beneath my, my dam or my hydraulic structure. Now why is this um, important? Well. Typically when we design dams, we have some downstream elevation that we want the water to be. So, you know, if I put a piezometer down to that elevation right there, I want the water to rise up to my design elevation. Of course, if I put a piezometer upstream, I know that the piezometer is going to rise up to the level of energy or total head that is in the water surrounding it. So in other words, you know, that difference between the, up, the head upstream and the head downstream, that's the amount of head that my dam or the soil um, in my dam needs to um, cause the water to lose as the water seeps through the dam. So here's the problem with piping. If I put a piezometer down to my pipe and I allow the water to rise up in my piezometer, how high is it going to go? Well, there's nothing getting in the way of that water as it enters the dam or the reservoir into that pipe. So that water is going to rise all the way up to the same elevation as um, my upstream dam. And that implies then that from this point all the way to the ground surface here, that little length there is not very long, yet I still have to lose the same amount of head.
You recall that gradient is equal to the change in head divided by the length over which that flow or seepage occurs. So if I reduce the length over which seepage occurs, that's going to lead to unhappiness because now I have to lose all of this head over a shorter distance. And I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. What is going to happen is that my pipe is just going to keep growing and growing until it pops out on the other end. And then I have just full-blown water spurting out. And then the dam fails. That's piping. Heaving is similar, but it deals more with excavation. So if I have an excavation and I have groundwater, and I have groundwater on both sides. So the water used to be right there, but now we pumped it down. So now, uh, because construction workers don't like swimming in open water, we have uh, pumps running that are keeping the water down at the bottom. So now water, of course, wants to go from high head into low head, and it's going to want to seep down and pop up uh, in the bottom of my excavation. Same idea, right? There's my change in head. And then I have my seepage length, of course, that I have to watch out for. If I'm not careful, I can get complete heaving in the bottom of my um, excavation. And it's actually a very dangerous condition. People have died because uh, excavations have heaved and people have been buried alive in the stuff that uh, gets exploded up from the bottom of the excavation. And then, of course, the picture or the little video we saw at the beginning dealing with liquefaction. Uh, this, this isn't related really to seepage of water through the soil, but it deals more with um, how cyclic shaking from an earthquake can induce seepage in the soil because the soil particles want to get closer together and reduce the void space, thus squeezing the water out of the soil. If the water can't squeeze out fast enough, then we get a zero effective stress condition that's temporary. and We call that liquefaction. We're not really going to worry about that in this class, but we're going to focus more on these guys. Let's do a little example to demonstrate how we might compute um, a factor of safety. I say against piping, but what I really mean is heaving. We're going to compute the factor of safety against heaving into the bottom of this excavation. A couple of things we want to point out. This uh, upper soil is clay with these following properties. And let's say that we dig down our excavation until we have a total of three feet between the bottom of our excavation and then this sand layer that's down below it. Now if we were to put a piezometer down to any point in this sand, the water would rise up in the piezometer to this level here, which happens to be four feet above the bottom of our, of our excavation. Okay, so that's what the problem, that's what we're dealing with. Now we're looking specifically at a point A in our sand, and we want to evaluate what the factor of safety against heave is at the very bottom of our excavation, and then we want to compute the effective stress at point A. So let's go ahead and compute the um, factor of safety against heave. We need to get the critical gradient. So the critical gradient is going to be the gradient in this clay layer where all our head loss is occurring. And so here's our equation for critical gradient, and all we need to do is plug in our values. So here's our um, our uh, specific gravity, and here is our void ratio. So we're just going to plug those in, and we compute a value of 1.0 conveniently for this problem. Okay. So next, we need to find out what the actual gradient is in that soil, the maximum actual gradient. So of course, we know gradient equals change in head over change in length. Well, that's this equation right here. So the change in head, of course, is just going to be the difference between my um, uh, the, the total head at point A versus what the total head would be for a point at the bottom of my excavation. And that change in head is simply equal to that four feet.
then the length that that drop of water needs to travel to get from the sand up into the bottom of my excavation is equal to three feet. So the gradient in the bottom of my excavation is equal to 1.33. Well, we've got a problem right off the bat. I can see that my actual gradient here is larger than my critical gradient. And that right off the bat tells me that we have a heave problem. If I compute the actual factor of safety, I just take the ratio of the critical gradient to the actual gradient, and I get this value of 0 0.75, much less than 1. That tells me that this excavation is going to heave. Let's compute the uh, effective stress at point A. There's two different ways we can do this, and if you uh, want to go back to the previous lecture where we talk about effective stress, you can learn a little bit about these different methods. The first method is we're just going to compute the total stress minus the pore pressure. And total stress is just the saturated unit weight of our soil times its depth minus uh, then the pore pressure. The pore pressure is just the height in of the water in the piezometer at that point. If you were to put a piezometer in the ground at that point, how high would the water rise in that piezometer times the unit weight of water? That's the, how we compute the pore pressure. So let's go ahead and, and plug these values in. We can compute what the uh, saturated unit weight of the soil is using our phase relationships from a few lectures ago. We know the soil is saturated. That's the definition of saturated, so it, uh, the degree of saturation is 1. And so we get almost 125 pounds per cubic foot for our saturated unit weight. We plug uh, saturated unit weight in times the depth into the soil minus the unit weight of water times the height that the water rises inside the piezometer at point A. So that's going to be seven feet of height of water rising in a piezometer. And so when we compute that out, we get minus 62.4 pounds per square foot of effective stress. The negative sign means that essentially, um, in, instead of there being compressive effective stress, we have tensile effective stress, or the soil is trying to explode or pull itself apart which, you know, it doesn't really make sense. All it means is we have a zero effective stress condition. The second method that we could apply is um, computing the buoyant stress, that's this guy right here, minus the seepage stress or the seepage pressure. And um, all we need to remember with this technique is whether or not we're going to use a plus or a minus. And you'll remember that if we have upward seepage in the ground, it's going to be a minus. And if we have downward seepage in the same direction as gravity, it's going to be a plus. So because we have upward seepage here, that's why we have a minus in our equation. So we just plug in. Um, here's our buoyant unit weight right here. Remember, that's saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water times the um, depth below the ground surface minus the critical, uh, the gradient, that's the actual gradient, I'm sorry, not the critical, it's the actual gradient in the ground times the unit weight of water times the depth below the ground. And we should get the same answer as before. So you can see that we can predict whether or not we're going to have a heave problem just by computing the effective stresses. Okay, um, I want to close the book now on the topic of zero effective stress. And I want to switch gears to talking about effective stress in partially saturated soils. Whoops, I'm supposed to be underlying, not crossing out. Partially saturated soils are interesting, is interesting stuff. So I go back, uh, let's get my black pen out. If I go back and I draw my soil particles, and I, I want to draw good soil particles for this example. Okay, so now I have some pretty good soil particles there. If I have totally saturated soil, you can imagine that the entire void space is going to be completely filled up with water. And that makes sense. But if I have partially saturated soil, the water tends to just kind of attract itself to the connections where the soil particles touch.
and the water kind of helps serve as a uh, uh, you can think of it almost as a bonding agent between the soil particles uh, and, and that's why if you get sand moist or wet you can use it to make things like um, sand castles or sculptures or things because the water helps add some stickiness or uh, some apparent cohesion to the sand. I'm trying to show which are the sand particles there. So what causes the water to want to do that and, and to stick to, to soil particles in that manner? Well, really what it has to deal with is this idea or concept of capillary rise. If I stick a straw down into a glass of water or a glass of soda pop, for instance, you're always going to get some water that rises up inside that straw. Now, this always seems like a magic trick, especially if I do it with my kids, you know, because they're like, whoa, that water's rising up all by itself. But here's the deal. We know from conservation of energy that water just can't magically raise itself without there being a, an equal and opposite energy reaction. We know that um, from Bernoulli's equation that that uh, piezometric head is equal to the pressure head plus the elevation head. Now if water rises up inside that capillary tube, pressure or elevation head is increasing. But we know that total head or elevation or piezometric head, excuse me, has to remain constant. It can't be going up or down. So if elevation head is going up, that means that pressure head has to be going down. What does that mean? Well, that means that inside this water, inside the, uh, the capillary tube there, the pore pressure is negative. In other words, if I stick, uh, imagine if I have an instrument that I can stick down and it has a little sensor on it. And that sensor uh, can measure pore pressure. We actually have these types of instruments. They're called pore pressure transducers. So if I put a pore pressure transducer down right to the elevation of um, the water surface, that pore pressure transducer would tell me that the pore pressure is equal to zero. Now if I push it down even a little bit further, down into, you know, below the water surface into the body of the water, what that's going to tell me is that the pore pressure is greater than zero. Uh, if I plot on this plot shown on the right, pore pressure, that's water pressure, so this direction is positive, this direction is negative, and then versus um, the elevation of my transducer, As I push that transducer down into the body of the water, I'm going to see the pore pressure increase with depth. That's the trend I'm going to see. And right at the elevation of the, the top of the water, it's going to equal zero. I think everybody should be following me up to this point. But what's going to happen if I put the pore pressure transducer somewhere up here into the middle of my um, my capillary tube, what would it read me? It would read that the pore pressure is less than zero. In other words, if I were to plot pore pressure inside that capillary tube, it would be negative pore pressure. It would be negative. And the slope of that line doesn't change. I mean, the slope of that line is simply the unit weight of water. But it's only that way, of course, um, it's only that way um, if, of course, we assume a couple of things, that the degree of saturation in that tube is 100%. So a couple of things we need to know, okay? The height that the water rises in that capillary tube is a function of a few things. It's a function of the, um, the diameter of the tube. It's a function of the tensile strength of the fluid and of course it's a function of that uh, angle of the meniscus that forms as the water tries to climb the tube. But one of the most important values in this of course is the diameter of the tube. So if this diameter gets smaller and smaller and smaller you could see that that the height that the water can climb in the tube gets higher and higher. Uh, 
So as the, di as the diameter of the tube decreases, the capillary rise tends to increase. Well, what does this have to do with soil? Well, it has everything to do with soil because soil void space is, sim think of it as a bundle of little teeny capillary tubes of all different types of diameters. And so the water is going to climb up in the, in the pore space or the void space of soil just like it's going to climb up this little straw or capillary tube. So in soil, only the portion of the capillary zone directly above the groundwater table is fully saturated. Okay, uh, the further up you go, the less your degree of saturation is. And, and to the point where if you're up here in this unsaturated zone, um, you're going to be using, for instance, a moist unit weight. It's not saturated. And it, it makes sense if you're in the saturated zone that you're going to use a saturated unit weight. The question is, what do we do in this fringe zone, this transition between saturated and unsaturated? Well, most, most geotechnical engineers use the moist unit weight to compute the total stresses and effective stresses. But if we wanted to, we can account for negative pore pressure if we know the height of this capillary rise. But that's really the trick, right? How do we know how high the true capillary rise is? And it's really hard to measure in the field. People who have measured it have found that in general, if you have a coarse sand, your zone of capillary rise can be between you know, around half a foot. If you have a fine sand, so smaller particle diameters, it can increase it from one to four feet in general. If you have a silt, it can be anything between two and a half to 25 feet of capillary rise. And if you have clay, well, it could be anywhere between 25 to 75 feet of capillary rise. And you have to remember that in this zone of capillary rise, we have negative pore pressure, which in turn is going to increase our effective stress. If we want to account for that increase, then what do we do? Well, we need to um, try to compute it. Um, oh, uh, before I get to that, I, I do want to ask this question, you know, looking at these different soils, what trend do we tend to notice? Well, the trend that we tend to notice is that the smaller the pore space, like in the clays or the silts, the higher the capillary rise. So if we want to compute this negative pore pressure in these zones of capillary rise, we can go ahead and use a very simple approximation equation to, to estimate what that pore pressure is going to be. And it's simply the negative um, ratio of the degree of saturation to 100 times the unit weight of water times the height above, above, not below, above the water table. Okay? So this is the equation we're going to use. I'll show you how it works. Let's imagine we have this three layer soil problem where I'm interested in computing stresses and pore pressures at this point, at this point, and at this point. So let's go ahead and compute the total stress at this point. You should be able to turn off or pause this lecture and compute the total stresses yourself. In fact, uh, go ahead and do that and, and get a little bit of practice and see if you can get these numbers that I computed. And then unpause it and come back and I'll show you how I got them. Go. Okay, hopefully you're back and you had a chance to mimic or imitate how I got these different total stresses. So at a depth of 10 feet below the ground surface, I've got 105 feet, or I'm sorry, 105 pounds per cubic foot, that's from the silt, times 10 feet from the ground surface. That's how I get the 1,050 PSF. Uh, for 15 feet, I'm gonna start with the stress at this first layer and I'm just going to work my way down to get the higher stress. So I get the 1,050 PSF plus 105 from the silt inside this zone of capillary rise. And we're going to assume then, of course, the moist unit weight for that times the, the thickness of 5 feet. 
and that's how I get 1575 PSF. Now for this point here at the depth of 30 feet, we start with the 1575 and work our way down. We're going to multiply the saturated unit weight of the clay times its depth of 15 feet into the clay, and that's how I get the 3225 pounds per square feet. Now comes the tricky part. How do I get pore pressure? Okay, well if my water table is right here at the top of my clay, and I come down 10 feet from the ground surface, uh, so I'm well above the water table, what's my pore pressure going to be at that point? Well, because I'm well above the water table and I'm outside, just, just barely outside the zone of capillary rise, I'm going to say that my pore pressure is zero. Now if I zoom in on that little circle there, so here's my boundary between my soil layers, Here's my point of interest, of course. Um, and let's say that I just step one little baby step into the um, capillary rise. We're going to step one little baby step called DZ into that capillary rise. So I'm just barely stepping into it. Then if that's the case, I'm going to compute a negative pore pressure. I'm going to use this equation that I had before, where pore pressure in the zone of capillary rise is negative times my degree of saturation um, in a percent divided by 100 times the unit weight of water times the height above my water table. So this is where I have S over 100. That's my 0.6. There's my unit weight of water and five feet is my height above my water table. So that's how I get negative 187 pounds per square feet. Okay. What about at a depth of 15 feet below the ground surface? So now uh, I want to know what the pore pressure is right on top of the uh, water table itself. Now this is where, remember the cap, the, the um, pore pressure transducer inside the capillary tube. If I lower that transducer down to the level of the body of water, the pore pressure transducer is going to tell me the pore pressure is equal to zero. So it's not negative, it's zero. And if I push down, down, put that transducer down to this depth of 30 feet below the ground surface, then that's simply just going to be the um, unit weight of water times the depth into that uh, below the unit weight, or I'm sorry, the depth below the groundwater table. And so that's my depth below the groundwater table unit weight of water, and I get 936 pounds per square feet, and notice that is positive. So how do I compute effective stress? Oh, those, those, I should have little apostrophe marks up there. Okay, little prime marks. So remember, effective stress is simply total stress minus pore pressure. So if we've computed both total stresses and pore pressures, all we have to do is plug them in. So at a depth of 10 feet, there's my total stress minus the pore pressure. Effective stress equals the total stress at that depth. When I step just into the zone of capillary rise, I have effective stress minus pore pressure, but remember pore pressure is really negative. So when I have, a, when I minus a negative number, it becomes positive, and I've actually increased my effective stress at that depth all of a sudden. And then <clears throat> as I go down to um, a depth of 15 feet below the ground surface, total stress minus pore pressure. So again, total stress is equal to effective stress. And then at a depth of 30 feet below the ground surface, total stress minus pore pressure. Now this is more the behavior you're used to. Um, effective stress is going to be less than the total stress once I get below my groundwater table. So when I'm in the zone of capillary rise, effective stress increases. When I'm below the groundwater table, effective stress decreases. All right, folks, that's all we have for this lesson. Hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave comments down below, and I'll be happy to get to them when I get a chance.
Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.